I think it's time we ask ourselves if we still know the freedoms that were intended for us by the founding fathers. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. Welcome to the Libertopian Podcast. Frederick Bastier once said, The plans differ. The planners are all alike. Here on the Libertopian Podcast, we don't want any planners. We want the free market to reign. And that's what we search for and that's what we advocate. Peter Schiff advocates that as well. And this past week he went to Congress to argue against the FHA loan program. Let's have a listen to what Peter had to say. My name is Peter Schiff, and I'm the CEO of Euro Pacific Capital. Among my many forecasts were that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, two government-sponsored enterprises at the heart of the housing bubble, would in fact go bankrupt. And I also forecast that Congress would make the mistake of bailing them out. Now, I bring this up now in the hopes that what I have to say, uh, these warnings will not fall on deaf ears, although judging by how few congressmen have shown up, Unfortunately, not too many are listening. In fact, this very hearing proves that Congress still doesn't understand the problem or its culpability in creating it. I don't know whether to go to Mr. Schiff or not, but I guess I will. Do you believe that the uh, private funders would come into the market without FHA support? Absolutely. Give give me an example. Well, you've got to get the government out to have a free market, but look at how... Capitalists are always looking to sell things to to lower income people. You can make a lot of money. There's a lot more low income people than rich people. And you can make a lot of volume. One of the richest men in in the country was Sam Walton. He made money selling things to low income people. If there's a demand for low income housing and if Congress stays out of the way, profit seeking private entrepreneurs will satisfy that demand. The problem is you've got all these private businesses looking to government. Right? Because they don't want to deal with a competitive I, marketplace. I, I would assume that you'd agree that there, there is a need for a secondary mortgage market in multifamily housing. If there is a need for it, the free market will okay. provide right. How do you that, get that's there? That's how markets function. Right. Well, I'm the just go- asking how you get there. Well, for, the government has to get out of the way. Right? Because as long as the government's there distorting it, I mean, right, look, 90% of the mortgages now are now guaranteed by the government. I mean, there's no, nobody is going to step in who can compete with the Treasury because the Treasury's, you know, got the taxpayer behind them. So there is no private market when the government comes in. It, it chases everybody else out. But you've got people here looking for the government to come in uh, to provide a guarantee so that loans could be made that the free market would deny. If the free market wants to deny a loan, there's a reason for that. If you agree that there is a need for FHA, would you kindly extend a hand into the air? About the audience. Excuse me, uh, Mr. <laughs> Shift, if you don't mind, I'll conduct this more dire. And I'll ask that you be kind and and uh, we'll get to you in just a moment. Your, your colleague there, Mr. Green, wanted to know who's in favor of HUD, and just about everybody here raised their hand because they directly benefit uh, from HUD. Sure, a home builder can sell a home at an inflated price uh, because of uh, the FHA, but there's people on the other side of these transactions who are losing money. There are plenty of people who are not at this table who suffer because Congress decides to subsidize the industries that are represented here. Without putting the taxpayers at risk. Yeah. Correct. Well, that, that's not. I yield true. back to balance yeah. my time. Can I, Madam Speaker? Yeah. There's there's yeah. tremendous Ms. cost here. Can I address this? There's tremendous cost to the taxpayer. That's why everybody's here. It's not because there's no. Sir, yeah. I'm going to resist my temptation. Uh, oh, don't do that on my account. I wasn't. I was. It's called moral hazard. It's unfortunate that politicians very often overlook the unintended consequences of their actions because what you do alters behavior. Okay, and so it can often make the very problem worse that you're trying to solve. For you to think that we should allow people to go uninsured, not subsidize the insurance, and then the United States Congress is not going to help people who are uninsured and hit by a disaster. Um, Maybe that happens in an Ayn Rand novel, but it doesn't happen in the United States Congress. In, in this you know, we, we, we did try my, my view uh, for a long time in this country. We became the wealthiest country the world had ever known. Well, because it, we had excuse me, we, we tried your view until about the 19-teens. The country has done, you can say, rather poorly over the last few years. 
Uh, but we did pretty well in the in the, in the uh, latter 80 percent of the 20th century. Don't take credit. Now, uh, excuse, excuse me, Mr. Schiff. Please, you know the decorum here is is not this yelling and, and you know I like a rant sometimes, but I think we've yeah. had enough of it. Remember, I represent the taxpayers here, and we're we're pretty upset at what's been going on. So Mr. Schiff. Yes. The time has expired. Uh, the Unfortunately, gentleman from Texas. you're right. Now, my favorite part of this entire clip is when Peter is trying to make his case, but the parasitical leeches on society that I like to call congressmen or congresswomen, for that matter, cut him off and tell him, uh, Mr. Schiff, we'll come back to you in a little bit. We don't really care what you have to say right now. You know, if I was Peter, I, I probably wouldn't have been as polite as he was. He, he basically just kind of you know laid back, but when they came back to me, I would have told them. I would have said, look, you invited me here. Now, I understand that as a parasitical leech on society, you get to sit above everyone else and dictate to them like you know what the hell you're talking about. But the reality is I work in the real world. I actually understand how the world works. I create jobs. I create business opportunities for people. You don't do any of that. In fact, you, have, you, you live in some Alice in Wonderland phase where you basically just sit in Congress and don't do anything. You know, you've got Member Nanky there in his little printing press printing up money, and you've got you guys in Congress just passing bills that you think will help the American people. Or what might be worse is you know that it won't help the American people, but you do it anyway because nine times out of ten, you're probably evil. And <laughs> if the reality was known, you know exactly what you're doing. You want to make the American people dependent so you can continue to rape them. Uh, you, you, you basically just get everyone addicted to handouts and then you go from there with it. And it's really sad. But Peter made some excellent points about how the, the market would come in in place of uh, flood insurance that's being provided right now by the federal government. I thought that was – he made excellent points there. And the reality is the market would come in. If people can't afford it, there's a reason for that. If it's so expensive to insure a home in a flood area, there's a reason for that. There is no reason for – basically the taxpayer to be on the hook for people who decide that they want to live in flood zones and people who want to live in flood zones do so because of a moral hazard the reality is without that moral hazard they might not want to live there at all and i think peter pointed that out really well moving on to further news though mitt romney had come out his political advisors namely in foreign policy, our former CFR, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission. You've got people on his advisor list who um, were part of the New American Century, which, as you know, two years before 9-11 said that we need a new Pearl Harbor to get uh, the agenda through that we want to get through, and you can take that how you want to take it. But uh, it's come out basically that he is exactly what we said he is going to be. He is a war hawk. He is going to go after Iran, not just Iran. He would probably go after Syria. He would probably start a war everywhere that he can start a war because it's going to be all about spreading the American empire and trying to get uh, the corporate interests that are controlling the government into as many countries as they possibly can get them into. So I did not find that all that surprising. I will say that uh, Obama... And his new stance on immigration is pretty scary because he completely subverted the Congress and basically came out with an edict and said, look, my Justice Department is not going to prosecute uh, illegal aliens. Uh, if they're under a certain age and they, they, got, they were brought here against their will at a certain age, basically saying that they were a kid when they were brought here, we're not going to deport them. Uh, what we're going to do is give them work visas instead which the reality is the justice department was already doing that and truth be known they were doing that underneath george w bush as well so i wasn't that shocked to hear it i'm really not sure why they actually came out and admitted it though because typically they won't do that typically they're going to do a lot of these things behind the scenes just like fast and furious it's not like they were going to come out and tell us they were shipping guns to mexico uh to blame the second amendment so it's obvious at this point in time that He's trying to do this for political reasons and to secure the Spanish vote, the Hispanic vote, and try to get more votes in from that area. And that's the only issue that I have with a lot of these immigrants. You know, I like immigrants. Uh, I don't like illegal immigrants because as soon as they get here, 
the Democratic Party comes in and tries to get them addicted to the welfare and try to get them on the uh, Democratic plantation, if you will. So that's typically what happens with illegal aliens. So that's my biggest objection there. You know, as a libertarian, we really want people to come here. Yeah, we want the free movement of not only capital, but the free movement of people. We want people to be free to move between borders, if possible. But at the same time, there's a part of me as a libertarian that says, look, national sovereignty is incredibly important. And America does have a duty to defend its borders and to maintain immigration standards. And that was the case whenever the country was founded. And I think, although for some libertarians, the Constitution isn't radical enough, I think at this point in time, if we could just get this nation back to the Constitution, we could be a lot better off. And so that's my take on the whole Obama immigration situation. Uh, Luke Radowski of We Are Change confronted Rand Paul over the Mitt Romney uh, endorsement. And to my surprise, Rand Paul just continued to walk and actually walked away from Luke Radowski, which is sad to me because Rand has never struck me struck me as struck me as a politician that would do that. You know, I can see a Barbara Boxer doing that or a Lindsey Graham doing that, you know, just to kind of – both sides of the aisle. You have your moderate politicians who are really just weasels, and – but I, I really just didn't see Rand doing that, and it's, it's actually sad to me to see him do that, and I don't know what's going on because when Luke asked him about the Bilderberg Group – he just kept walking. In fact, he walked faster. He just wanted to get away <laughs> from Luke's questions. And so I find that sad, and hopefully whatever Rand has been promised comes to fruition and that it's actually worth it and that my sincere hope is that he has not been turned to the dark side, if you will. You know, there's always that saying, if you dance with the devil, then sometimes you don't change or you, know, you don't change him he changes you. And so that's what I'm worried might have happened with Rand Paul. So hopefully uh, Rand sees the light and comes back towards liberty. At least that's what I'm hoping. But we will just have to see exactly what happens. Hopefully they might give him the vice president position, which I think could be an excellent position, you know, an excellent opportunity, if you will, for the ideas of liberty to get out there even more to the general public. Because the vice president, you know, that's a bigger spotlight, and Rand can definitely shine some a spotlight on civil liberties and uh, having a more moderate foreign policy, if you will, more principled foreign policy, something of that degree. Other than that, that's all I have on this week's edition of the Libertopian Podcast. Again, thank you for tuning in. I'll see you guys next week.